Awesome. Thank you, Adi. Uh, so I'm really excited, and Apple 2 is really excited to have with us Adam uh, Opak to talk about DevOps and digital transformation. And what's really cool, what I really love about these types of things is we're able to speak with an industry person that actually not only talks about something, but actually implemented it successfully for a large company. So I'm really excited about diving in to get some opinions of what he did to be successful at Capital One. And uh, I just want to encourage folks, if they have any questions as we're going along, just to add your questions in. And if there's a follow-up that you'd like me to try to ask Adam, uh, make sure to just to, to put your question in. I'll try to add it if I can. If not, we'll definitely get to your questions at the end of the webinar. So as Adi mentioned, I am Joe from joecolantoni.com, testtalks.com, and Automation Guild, a blog, podcast, and online conference dedicated to all things test automation related and where my mission is really to help you succeed with creating automation awesomeness. So before we get into it though, Adam, is there anything you'd like to tell us a little bit more about yourself? Um, let's see, I mean, Eddie did a great job uh, on the introduction. Um, well, I guess what I'll just add is that most of my experience has been uh, in the testing environment, leading testing groups and, and transformation and testing and uh, DevOps and, and driving towards continuous delivery has really been um, a more recent experience and focus of mine. Um, so I just want to, like, I am a tester at heart. My roots are in quality. Um, and I think that what you see in the industry around DevOps and continuous delivery, I mean, it really does start with testing. And, and that's kind of how I was able to get into this. Uh, as Eddie said, my uh, last four years, I was at Capital One. Um, where I led the enterprise testing group and release management and was on the forefront of driving not only our agile transformation in those areas, but then uh, our focus on DevOps and continuous delivery. Uh, and now I'm, uh, next week I start my next venture at Lincoln Financial, uh, where they're in the very early stages of the same transformation. So I'm excited to be here talking to you, Joe, and, and uh, look forward to everyone's questions. Awesome. Yeah, so I definitely want to dive into a few of those things, especially, uh, we'll get into it, your take on how you would change things uh, at your new gig. So we'll, we'll look into that soon. But before we get into that, I really want to make sure everyone's on the same page. A lot of times in the industry, as you know, uh, as testers, we hear a lot of buzzwords and we think like, how does it affect us? What does this mean, really mean? So I guess the first thing we should address before we get into it is, how do you define DevOps, like in the real world? Do you work for a large organization? What does that mean to you? What did it mean to you? What, what is DevOps to a tester? What should, why should we care, I guess, the question? Yeah, that's a, um, it's a, I'll tell you what, I, um, when we started talking about this webinar and going down this subject, um, I spent a lot of time trying to synthesize like exactly what that means because what everyone will find is that when you go Google DevOps, you go read different books, you're going to hear different things. Uh, you're going to see people have DevOps organizations or there's DevOps engineers. Um, and really, like to me, DevOps is about a mindset. It's a mindset focused on quality and speed through automation. Um, the term DevOps is, what it means literally is development and operations coming together on one team where that team is fully accountable for taking, developing, testing, and promoting a, a feature or product into production. Uh, that's the, the technical definition, but as you get into it, as you start, you know, driving transformation, you see that, okay, well, for us to have, you know, to practice this, we need to have a pipeline. We need to be practicing what's called continuous integration. Uh, we need to have automated tests. We need to think about performance and security and how that comes in. We need to be thinking about the cloud. And so, you know, it's much more than just taking people and moving them from one organization to another. It's now, it's, it's really this mindset and this evolution. And so again, like my Adam Auerbach definition is, it's a mindset focused on quality and speed through automation. Uh, you will see people have DevOps groups and teams and people. And I, um, while DevOps is not a person or a team, it is a mindset. Um, I will tell you that these are good things in the sense that it helps an organization uh, bring DevOps and those questions to the forefront, right? When you have a DevOps group, there's someone there hopefully evangelizing these best practices and why this is important and helping get leadership buy-in to what you're trying to do. 
Um, but if those organizations try to create a fiefdom and they're the only people that do certain things, well, now that's not DevOps, right? Now you're, you're kind of going back to the, the old school way of thinking. Um, but again, fo a mindset focused on quality and speed through automation. Awesome. And I definitely agree. So that this brings us into the essence of what is DevOps. And as testers, I think a lot of times it's still, even though, a lot of us have moved from waterfall to agile DevOps practices or what, what people think are DevOps practices. It's still almost like a agile fall. So how, how do we get yeah. there? How do we change that mindset, I guess? So um, when I think about DevOps and I think about where to start, the testing area, quality assurance, then that's the, to me the first place. Um, and so it first starts with what type of testing are you doing? Are you doing man only manual testing? Are you only automated regression testing? And so the, you know, now your focus has to be, how do I keep up with development? How do I build out automated tests so that when a developer is ready to check something in, there is something automated that I can sit down with them and run through, and then that becomes part of our pipeline, and it's now this part of this automated assembly line, if you will, uh, that gets built upon itself in order to automatically certify uh, a code. So, you know, as a tester, the DevOps to me means be automating what I'm doing, taking a different approach possibly uh, to how I'm testing, to what tools I'm, I'm using, to maybe even my skill set in general. I need to understand what a C, what CI is, what, what the different CI tools are, the different automation frameworks. Um, I have to get closer to, to a developer and what they're working on and, and how they're building it. Um, but by doing those things, you know, I'm, you'll hear the term shift left. Quality has to shift left uh, as part of a DevOps transformation. And again, it's around uh, embracing the different automation tools and really being able to, you know, partner with an engineer uh, in order to have automated tests uh, created early and often that then become part of that pipeline in that process. Awesome. So, you know, you mentioned a few things there. And I guess one of the things I think a lot of people get confused on when they hear automation, they automatically assume we're talking about functional testing. But I think in DevOps, it means something else. So when you say automation, what does that include? What's the umbrella of things that you can you should be automating as you move towards this shift left world? Yeah, so um, when, you th when I think about automation, like I'm thinking about everything. Uh, I'm starting at unit tests. Every, every code that piece of code that gets checked in has automated unit tests to go along with it. Um, from there, uh, you know, at Capital One and other companies, we practice BDD or behavioral driven development or, or what people call acceptance test driven development. So we would have, um, you know, automated acceptance tests for all of our stories. Uh, and that typically is at the API uh, layer. Um, and then, you know, performance tests, using open source tools like JMeter and being able to, to have that as part of your pipeline. And then also security tests are some great open source tools. So really like you can have the full gamut of automated tests. And then of course, Apply tools uh, from a, a UI validation perspective, um, you know, you add that to the mix. So really like to me, test automation is not just, you know, automating regression tests or automating just what I what I call functional tests or end-to-end -end tests. It's really like decomposing the application into those components, being able to hit all of them and looking at everything that we would do to certify and getting that automated. Because again, like if we're talking about speed um, and quality, if I just have performance tests at the very end and that's my pipeline, most likely I'm, it's gonna take a long time to run, I'm gonna find stuff and it's gonna be too late to fix. And so I need to be able to shift that left and be able to have indications of performance early on in that process. And so the same thing with security. And so like you're really looking at automating the, that core functionality in order to certify your features. Now, I'm not telling you you have to automate everything. There's still, you still want to do ad hoc testing. There's still some level of things that make sense not to automate. Um, but uh, everything that you need to allow something to move to production should be automated. No, I think that's a great point. Uh, I know in my company, uh, the thing that we trip up on a lot is the builds on automated. 
So if you can't even automate a build, I mean, how, how, how far are you going to get with DevOps? So it really is, I think, like you said, it's a mindset where everyone should be involved in it from the beginning. So developers, I think, should be thinking of how can I make this more automatable, even if it's not from a functional point, but can I make this build automatable? Because if I can't, then it's you won't be able to really get the benefit, I think, that you, that you touched on already. So um, two things there. Uh, number one, DevOps is coming together of people breaking down silos. So what you just said there is so critical. I need, as a tester, I need to be able to work with my engineer. They need to write automatable code, right? We can't have, if they're, right, if they're, if you're building out a website and the tags or the properties aren't correct or they have sloppy HTML, like writing automated tests is going to be very difficult. And so there is accountability on everybody on the team that the automated tests have to pass. In fact, like it really should be part of your definition of done. If you're practicing agile and it's in your story, having working automated tests need to be part of that acceptance criteria. And that has to be everybody's goal. Uh, we had great success stories where an automated test breaks and a developer is going in to fix the automated test, right? I mean, it doesn't have to be like only a test or only NG. Like everybody is accountable. Um, the other thing that you said too, um, by focusing on testing, testing is usually a long pull here because a lot of times if we look at like think about the testing pyramid, um, I, I guarantee most people will have a, a lot of UI tests in, in the top there. And that's what they're focusing on. And so when you talk about focusing on testing, you're talking about changing that pyramid, changing their focus from doing everything from the UI to being more around the APIs, um, to more in the, in the unit testing. Um, and so like there is a mindset change of how, and that does take a little bit longer, but you do need to have the uh, version control system. You do need to have, you know, an ability to kick off the builds automatically to be able to then run your different uh, unit and acceptance tests and then perhaps build out your environment and then run the next set of tests and, and so forth and so on. Um, but like for us starting with testing, uh, it just made a lot of sense and gave a lot of people experience using those tools so that as we needed more people who had that knowledge, it opened up even more doors for them. Awesome. So I'm, what I keep hearing you almost uh, say is that it really is, it's, it's a culture thing. And so I guess the next question I have is a lot of times when we work for big companies, they go, oh, this only would work in a little company. So how big of an effort was it that you actually implemented at Capital One? I mean, and how, how were you able actually to make that digital transformation to change that culture from rather than, you know, this is a, just a check mark on my DOD to, hey, this is just how we develop software? So um, Capital One had over a thousand agile teams. Wow. So you're talking about a fairly large organization. Um, now, granted, there are places in Capital One or in any company that are more advanced, more you know, um, they're building you know greenfield applications, and so definitely starting in those areas is easier, right? You, you, there is no you know if there's no legacy product, no third party to deal with. Like if you're building something from scratch and if it's, you know, something for the web or a mobile platform, like that is an easier place to start. There are more Java based tools available for people. Um, and so you definitely can start there. Uh, but I will tell you that all of this has applications in every aspect of development, regardless of at agile, waterfall, mainframe, uh, Java, .NET, all these principles can apply. While you might not be, everybody might not deploy multiple times a day, they will get faster, you will have higher quality, you will become more efficient, and that's something that everybody can buy into. Um, I will tell you, um, I do get asked a lot around, like, well, how do you drive this change? How do I, like, I've been talking about this, but I can't really get buy-in. And, and so the, the big thing that we talk about is, um, getting somebody in leadership to say okay to an experiment, um, and that's what we had done. We had we found two uh, two platforms, different lines of business, and we said, hey, we went to the leadership team. We talked about DevOps and, and why it was important, and they all nod their heads and said, yep, sounds really great. And we got two people, two leaders, to say, yep, we will sponsor experiments in our space. Um, and so we went, we worked with those teams. We got their pipelines built out, helped them with their test automation and, and getting to the cloud. 
And they were able to go back in front of leadership and show them how these experiments were successful in different areas and why, and then got them to say, yes, let's do this more broad, more broadly. And then we did more experiments in each of their areas and kept coming back to them to show them progress or lack thereof. And what, and then we did other things like have community events, like open spaces and conferences. And what that does is it builds this like top down, bottom up momentum where leadership is bought in and they get it. Uh, and they're accountable for driving it. But then the people on the ground who are doing the work are getting rewarded. They're getting recognized as, as being a leader. Um, and like change just happens really quickly. And with like within like six to 12 months, like you just see this tidal wave of change where all of a sudden everyone's got a pipeline and everyone's got automated tests. And, and w you know, we used to release 500 uh, times a month. We're now doubling and tripling that. Uh, you know, based on just a handful of applications doing the thing is deliver. I mean, it's just happens really quickly, but you have to have both. If top down only is driving it and, and the people aren't energized, they don't have the time. They're not like, it's going to fail. And if, if the bottom up is trying to push for it, but up top, no one gets it. No one's giving them the time. It's going to fail as well. So you really need to create a, a top down, bottom up approach for it. No, I think that's a great, great point. You know, it is this tricky balance, but you really do need both. Uh, because either way, if it comes from top down, then it just becomes a process. And if it comes from the bottom up, then you're not going to get the support that you need to actually do it. So I think there's some great, great points you have there, Adam. I, I, I guess the next worked, question. Go ahead. Sorry, sorry Joe. Just one, one more thing. The, I will tell you that um, change, I, I've been at companies where it's very top down driven right, where leadership says, let's go left, and everyone is focused on how to get up to left, how to do that quickly, and right, and just go. Um, and, uh, but then I've been at other organizations where leadership says left, and then everyone down below says, well, do we really want to go left, and is left right, and, and how does that, and I will tell you that, um, and then when they say, well, no, instead of going left, we should actually go right, and then leadership buys it, like, change happens much quicker there than when it's just top down driven because everybody's bought in because even though leadership had a direction people are energized because they feel like they had a voice they you know understand why they're doing it they're getting rewarded for that and change happens much quicker in even though it sounds maybe counterintuitive it happens much quicker because people are bought in and feel like they're a part of it versus like I'm just focusing on execution and I'm just going that way Absolutely. And I like how you said start small. So if, if you have a small team that, that does it for like a, a, a spike on, on a sprint and they could see, hey, this actually saves me time. I'm able to release the software quicker, faster. That once people see the benefits, then it's almost like a wildfire. It would catch on over time, I would think. I don't know. Was that your experience when, when you actually started um, implementing that Capital One? For some cases, yes. Uh, other times it's not that easy and um, why you have to do a lot of experiments is because like what we saw is that um, in one line of business we would say hey here's an experiment and look at the success but another line of business would say well we're different we use COTS products we yeah. you know they're them we're us uh, I don't believe you and so you you have to do it in their terms in order to show them that yeah, it does work uh, the other thing too which is a great tool is value stream analysis so we would sit down with teams and ask them, let's talk through how do you take business intent and get it to production? And just walking through that process with them and whiteboarding it out, documenting, you know, now that, that conversation itself can be four hours or so, but what you get to is like, here's an eight person team, but we have one person dedicated to builds and one for deployments and hey, we're doing automation, but it's regression, it's after the fact, and that's one dedicated person. And oh, by the way, we have a 30% defect leakage rate, so we have a ton of rework. And so what you get to is, hey, this eight-person team is doing four people worth of work, and they're deploying once a month. And you can show leadership and the business, hey, if you had automated builds and deployments, if you had test automation, you make these investments, you could double the productivity of this group. Um, and so value stream analysis became a very powerful way of putting it in terms that the business and that those tech leaders could understand because we did it for them. Uh, that was probably the biggest selling uh, tool that we had to get people to say, okay, 
like, let's do this. And, you know, it always sounds like some of the simplest things are the hardest. So you, you mentioned value stream analysis or BDD. And where I think the value comes from that is the conversations, right? I mean, it sounds obvious, but for some reason, when you work on 100 sprint teams, a lot of times they act like they're their own little company. But if you can get everyone together, have conversations, get the buy-in, you might be better off, it sounds like. So um, the one thing that we did to, uh, to spread the word and, and the goodness is we did open spaces. Um, so we would, these are internal events, you know, 100 to 150 people. And what we would do is we would have our enterprise experts. We'd invite people, the teams that were doing the experiments, and then anyone else who was passionate about it. And we would do these every other month for a year. Um, and they were focused, first they were focused on tester and development, then they were focused on service virtual, excuse me, service virtualization, and then continuous delivery. Um, but what that did was, like, you got everybody in a room, no preset agenda. You could just, you know, okay, why are you here? What questions do you have? Break off into different groups and talk and network. And what that did was it broke down some of the silos. Um, because in a large organization, you have all these little fiefdoms. People think that what's happening in my space is what's happening everywhere else. They don't know who to talk to. And so having like these internal conferences and open spaces really helped us get the word out, help build people's networks uh, and educate people. Uh, and so that also now like a Capital One, they have an annual uh, software engineering conference called CCON. Um, Gene Kim actually mentions it in the, uh, the DevOps handbook that just came out. Um, and that's a conference. It's about, we hold it. It's got 2000 people attend it. It's, it's uh, only Capital One people are presenting, they're the only ones attending, uh, and it's a way just to socialize all the different experiments and goodness and help build people's networks so they know who at the company. And I think that's another way to accelerate the change is like you got to get people together talking about it, similar problems, similar questions, and that also will help fuel the fire. Awesome. So, Adam, let's be honest. Let's get real here. I, I can already see in the questions, people, uh, some trepidation about doing this. So a common question that people are asking and also that I get asked a lot is like, come on, all right, we understand the benefits of it, but I'm a QA person. I'm the only one in the sprint team. You're telling me I have to do all this extra automation on top of my manual testing, on top of all, everything else I need to do. So how does this really work? Seriously. I mean, you have two to three weeks to do a sprint. How do you incorporate all these different changes that teams need to, to do to actually make the shift? Well, um, it's not, uh, you don't click your fingers and all of a sudden it's done. Um, you know, on an existing team, this could be a six to nine month transition. Um, it starts with, you know, number one, everybody needs to become an engineer. So if you're doing manual testing today, you're going to need to learn how to write code. Um, or you might need to start thinking about what, you know, maybe become a scrum master or a product owner or something else. That is the way that we are going. Everyone's becoming engineers regardless of development or testing. Um, then it's the tools. Um, you know, there's, there's some great third party big box tools. Then there's some, some awesome open source tools. Open source tools require you to know some programming. Um, and so again, you're getting closer to being an engineer. So once you're getting your, your technical skills are getting improved and you're going to need coaches, you're going, we, we had a two day training class that we put teams through and then we would have technical coaches who would spend a couple hours every day with teams. Then we have enterprise teams that have office hours. So there's a lot of, and then we had a capital one university for people to uh, get training. So there's definitely a lot of uh, handholding and support you're going to need to provide teams as they go through this, but then you're going to need to look at, um, you're going to look at how they're doing their testing. Like I said, we went to ATZ, Acceptance Test Driven Development, for our testing approach. Uh, that meant using tools like Cucumber and Java or Cucumber and Ruby. Um, that also means then change, like I mentioned earlier, changing your approach to testing. No more big, a lot of end-to-end -end tests. You know, I'm breaking them down into components uh, and smaller chunks, um, making the team be more accountable. And then also I'm feathering in some of these other things like, service virtualization because I need to eliminate the constraints that I have because these other systems aren't available or I can't have this. Uh, test data, 
is really big. At, at Capital One, we built our own test data portal, which was API driven so that people could condition uh, their data, you know, outside of their tests and, and run it. So like, it, th this is not like you wave a magic wand, you use, pick up a tool and you're doing it. It is an evolution. It is going to take time. Um, and it is work, but I guarantee you like this, this, if you're not doing it today, your company will be doing it in the next three to five years. No, I, don't, I, I definitely agree with that. Um, I have some stats here, actually, that, that mentions this. So I, I looked at a few surveys preparing for this uh, webinar with you, and all of them say, uh, for, exa exa for instance, uh, this right scale survey mentioned that when they interviewed people or did a survey in 2015, 66% of people said that they were going to invest in or do something sort of DevOps ad adoption. And in 2016, it was up to 74%. So now I would think it's even higher. So if people aren't doing it now, I would think that this is definitely, you need to get in the game now. I think it's going to be almost like, I don't know if you agree with this, but you know how agile was before, where now it's kind of like, it's just part of how we develop software. DevOps is almost going to lose the name DevOps and it's just going to be, this is how we develop software. I don't know, your thoughts around that? Yeah, um, I totally agree. Uh, the Puppet Lab survey, uh, they, uh, every year that Puppet Labs puts out their DevOps survey, um, and that has some wonderful metrics. And one of the things that they, there's like four metrics that they correlate. Um, but what they're seeing is that companies that are more advanced in their DevOps maturity are more profitable. They have higher employee engagement and satisfaction. And, uh, and typically the, the beacon companies that you're looking at comparing your company to are already doing this. And so I totally agree with you about that. Like this is the next step from agile. Um, a lot of times when I talk at conferences, I bring up a slide and I show them how we were doing agile, which is, you know, a lot of times it's like a couple sprints and then a hardening sprint and then you're deploying. And, and you had mentioned it earlier, like that's, that's kind of like agile fall or, or agile fail. Right. Uh, and even people who are deploying every sprint still are doing like little waterfall iterative, uh, iterations, not really true, uh, agile. And so, um, to me, DevOps is the next, you've adopted agile, you're working in teams, you have sprints, you have, hopefully you're getting MVP, like DevOps is the next maturity. You want to be able to actually put stuff in your customer's hands, do AB testing, be able to incorporate their fast feedback. Like you need DevOps. Uh, you don't have to do DevOps and be agile, but for you to maximize your agile experience, it is the next step in that journey. Awesome. And I, I think a lot of times people just focus on the fast piece of it, but really it's all about quality. And I think as testers, that's something we take very seriously. So for people, and a lot of times I have a manual tester, I'm just a manual tester. It almost sounds like this is actually the environment where a manual tester or a tester will flourish. They almost get elevated. I said this before, it almost like they become a shepherd of all these groups to say, okay, quality now is number one. And it's not just my responsibility, it's the whole team's responsibility. And it's up to them really to get the whole organization on board and to really drive this digital transformation. What have you seen in your experience to drive the digital transformation? Is this the type of, um, how, how does it usually bubble up from a, a tester or a QA person that then rallies the team around them or? Well, um, I will tell you that uh, like this is a golden opportunity for quality professionals. Right. Um, what I've seen is is our the people that were focused on automation on performance, like they were able to um, build out tools and frameworks to enable feature teams and then elevate their own skills to be more around performance engineering or you know how do we dockerize all of our test environments and do other things. Like there's so much here that uh, that quality people can be able to take on. Um, I mean, it's really like, it is a pivotal point for us at, as a community uh, in our careers. Uh, as a QA person on a team, the whole team owns quality. What does that mean? What does, like, how do I take business intent as a story and help my developers and product owner understand like acceptance for that? Um, how do I, you know, write the right level of tests in order to certify this? How does everybody understand what dependencies we have and, and what and possibly what we need to do a little bit like there is so much here 
Um, like if you're a manual tester, you know, where you want, what, where you want to focus on, do you want to get more technical and hands on? Do you want to be more aligned to like, there's just, there are a ton of opportunities. And what I will tell you is, um, what we had seen is, um, those that are doing DevOps and, and eventually continuous delivery deploy up to like 12 times more frequent than, um, someone who's not. And the rate of, of production defects is like so minimal compared to those who aren't. Uh, literally over a six month period, we had two production issues with teams practicing continuous delivery where, and there were much, much more for those not doing it. So um, when you talk about a play on quality, I mean, this is it. Uh, because again, like I, I like to talk about the Toyota and on cord where, you know, TQM talks about like stopping the assembly line at any point to tell someone it doesn't work and you fix it. Like that's what we're doing here. Instead of being a third class citizen, instead of having to wait until something's perfect for you to test it um, and then having to have everything crystal, you know, the pristine when you're doing your testing or it doesn't work, like, no, we're going to get in there early and often. And when it's broken, someone's going to fix it. I'm not going to need to log a defect because I'm working closely with a developer. Um, the quality just skyrockets. And, and this is a wonderful opportunity for us to learn about these tools, to learn about this practice and embrace it and, and become experts and evangelists for the teams and, and those that are practicing. Awesome. Yeah, I definitely agree. So uh, like I said, I've seen people in the chat already saying I'm a manual tester. Uh, what do I have to do? I think you, I would really embrace DevOps if you haven't already learned the, the language, the, the terminology, uh, the tools, and, and really get involved within your organizations and they'll see you as an asset. Uh, so I wouldn't worry about losing a job. I don't think QA people are ever going away. And so I, I would think I would take this as an opportunity, not as, as a way that you think you're going to be replaced by automation. Just encourage yeah. people out there that think that. Well, I, here's what I'll tell you. I mean, I, I have, I've had, you know, hundreds of, of QA people reporting to me. This is an opportunity. Um, don't get scared. Embrace it. Go read Gene Kim's The Phoenix Project. Go read Jez Humble's book on continuous delivery. Go read Google's uh, How They Test Software. And then pick up a programming book. Pick up a Java book or a Ruby book. And, and uh, there's Cucumber and Ruby, Cucumber and Java. And, uh, you know, and work partner with some of your developers. Maybe they write some of the first automation tests and help you understand some of that code that you can then reuse. Um, it's going to take some work. Uh, you know, it's not easy, uh, but like there will always be QA people. It's just that now the tech, like the technical skills are becoming more in the forefront, but, but you're not writing a program. It's, it's, you're more technical, but not necessarily a developer per se, but you do need to understand how, how the donuts are made, if you will. Um, but, it, uh, you know, Capital One going through their transformation, there are still many, many testers uh, in that organization. Very cool. And so, Adam, I know a lot of times when we talk about testing or automation, once again, I know you touched upon it, but... When someone's really doing DevOps or doing more automation, it still comes back to the question, are you more prescriptive? Were you prescriptive at, at uh, Capital One when you said all teams shall do it this way? For example, I'm getting some questions in the chat. Uh, for example, who does unit testing? Does the d developers actually help with the UI automation? What was the breakdown of your sprint teams of how they divvied up the work in regards to testing and automation? <laughs> Yeah, so um, at, at the end of the day, as you mature, it becomes everybody's responsibility. And it could be, you know, as you get to a team of engineers, maybe sprint by sprint, people are changing. Initially, yes, like we had testers and their job was automation and testing. Depending on, like if they just started learning how to code and learning how to do the automation, what would happen? Developers would write their unit tests and then the tester um, either would do the acceptance, the automated acceptance test, or maybe that they just wrote the Gherkin, the cucumber uh, acceptance um, f uh, feature and scenario. And then they sat with the developer in like a pair programming kind of format 
and the developer maybe wrote the code or, or helped the tester do that. Um, but I, ideally, you know, you know, it, it, we weren't prescriptive to say there's nine people on a team. There's a, uh, you know, you have this many developers, this many testers, like capital one is not very prescriptive in that month, that way. It was more around, we need to be doing unit testing. The tests need to be tied into a pipeline. We need to be doing ATDD acceptance tester and development. Um, we need to show that there's, you have the hundred uh, percent coverage and traceability uh, prior to going to production. So we had some high level guardrails, if you will, but whether someone used Cucumber and Ruby or Cucumber and Java, I think I want to say at one point we had over 56 different test automation frameworks. So what we did is we, we had a central site where people could go and, sh and showcase their frameworks. We had a guild um, where people could do demos and see what was around there so that you could take something off the, cell the shelf and reuse or you could contribute it back. Basically like an inner sourcing model but there was no prescriptive of saying only you do this and you, that's that's really against agile and devops um, if somebody on the team wants to take something on they should be allowed to um, so not prescriptive we just said like what those high level guardrails had to be for something to move to production um, and then again like using things like pair programming or mob programming to help get people trained and skilled uh, as they transformed. Awesome, and you brought up some great points there. One of them, I'm just thinking of my own personal experience when for some reason, everyone always wants to create one massive framework. And so we're in all these different verticals. And I think that's really an impediment. Uh, it'll, it'll stop people from really advancing with DevOps as if they're forced to use a set of tools that their team isn't used to. So I, I definitely agree with you there. Well, like, I think, so um, one framework is bad to your point, like because now that framework requires maintenance, care and feeding, and becomes a bottleneck. Like I'm a team, I'm, I have a .NET application. This framework is based on Java. I need changes to it. Like if I only can go to that one team, it, like that that doesn't work. But the ability that they have a framework that I could bring it down to my local repo, I can make changes. Maybe I can give it back. Maybe I can help other people. Well, like number one, that's going to help spur innovation because everyone's empowered to, to, you know, be a part of the community and contribute. I can get recognition for contributing back. Um, you're not forcing me into something. I have some free will. Like that's how you drive change. That's how people get bought in. But if you say you can only use this one tool, you can only do it this one way, like you're creating a, that's not DevOps. Absolutely. And, and I just want to touch on another thing that you mentioned earlier, or, or someone brought up in the questions, was that I think a lot of times, once again, people get confused when we talk about automation. And what I've seen in my company is it gets kind of perverse where a developer says, I don't need to do unit tests anymore because we have a requirement that all tests shall have automated tests for them. And I'm like, well, what do you think unit test is? Unit testing mm -hmm. is. So yeah. What would you break down? Is there a, like a magic formula? Everyone's always looking for like thou shall have 80% of your test automated using UI test or how do you explain that to your teams? Um, we don't have a magic formula per se. Um, we do have a rule like there are teams that would say we have to have 95% unit test coverage and those tests have to pass before you go to the next gate. So I think there are um, like from a unit test perspective, you like you want to have some a bar set uh, to hold teams accountable to that. Um, there are tools. Um, sea Lights is a, a small company. They have a really cool product where it, it gives you insight into code coverage for your automated and performance tests. So I think tools like that are better because now instead of being a black box and saying we need so many tests and they have to be of, of certain breakdown. It's more about coverage. It's more about making sure that we have a test to go with all the different aspects of, of what we're rolling out, at least the critical ones, because um, I'm not a proponent of 100%. But I think like a tool like Sea Lights uh, is is a really great, powerful tool in that just like in unit tests, I can get great, I can be confident that I have the right level of coverage. Like Sea Lights gives you that, I mean, it's a shameless plug for them, but um, I think we're going to see more products like that where we can be positive to know we have the right coverage um, because having thousands of tests 
especially in a DevOps environment where you're driving through a continuous delivery, isn't going to be manageable. You, we're talking about you need a suite of tests that can run in minutes, um, not hours, not days. And so, like, there's no magic number or what percentage, but I just need to make sure that I'm covered, that they can, that they're atomic, that they can run on their own, that uh, they're quick, and and most likely they don't start at the UI. Most likely, except for maybe you know, if I'm using a tool like Apply Tools as some UI tests, but they're smaller in percentage compared to my API tests which are smaller compared to my unit tests. I mean, like, that's the general rule. Um, you know, if you look at Martin Fowler's uh, testing pyramid, uh, uh, Waiter has, another, has a testing pyramid similar. I mean, like, that's the ratio. Um, and that's part of what has to change, uh, being able to do it at the component level versus the UI. But um, I think I answered your question. Yeah, absolutely. So, Adam, we didn't rehearse this, but... Uh... I'd like to also mention C Lights. I interviewed the co-founder, uh, so check that out at testtalks.com. You'll get a good interview that goes more into detail. So talking about tools like C Lights, uh, you didn't mention Apply Tools just briefly. This is a webinar hosted by Apply Tools. It's actually a product I use and love. So I'm just wondering, is this a tool you actually use to help you with your efforts going towards DevOps? And if so, how did it help you get better coverage? Yeah, so um, when you go through this journey uh, and you think about that we're trying to create an automated assembly line where a developer does a pull request to check in their code and then that pull request uh, becomes part of a pipeline, unit tests are run, and then based on the success of that, a testing environment gets stood up, uh, your, your acceptance tests run some level of performance and security, so forth and so on, right? So like I'm building this automated assembly line that's going to automatically take something and then certify it to go to production. What we saw was that the one thing that that slowed this down is the UI. The UI changes a lot. The UI is very flaky. Um, there's some tools like Sauce Labs and Browser Stack, which can be great tools to help you know run one automated test against different browsers and configurations. So that definitely helps speed it up. Um, but every time an element moves or changes or whatever, like you're you might have a failed test. And so what ends up happening is that some of that stuff we end up leaving off from an automation perspective and just do it manually um, because you can do it much quicker and all these other things are running so you have some time. And I think, you know, for, for us and like the use of Apple tools, like we now have hope that those critical transactions that need to be validated from the UI, you know, Apple tools can fill that void uh, so that the amount of manual testing we do is really left down to like ad hoc, um, ad hoc testing, um, and so that's you know where those where we see the the adoption picking up from Apple Tools perspective. Awesome, and I've I've also spoken to a few people on test talks that actually use Apple Tools to help them just do a quick smoke test to make sure when they do a build that the build is correct that all the information is there. So it's really helpful. And in the comments, uh, Adam, a lot of people are asking. You know, you mentioned tools like Apple Tools. Sea lights uh, and cucumber a few times. Can you give us any a quick set of other tools that you think are essential for DevOps that you've used? Mm. Uh, so I'm a big proponent of uh, of open source tools. Uh, so cucumber uh, definitely from an AT, from a BDD perspective, you want to be able to you want to check out whether you use it with Ruby or, or Java. Um, the the next thing is uh, so. That's for a functional acceptance automation perspective. For performance, JMeter, um, we tried a bunch of different tools. JMeter, we, we were able to eliminate the need for quality center or for performance center through the use of, of JMeter. Um, so JMeter for performance, there's tools like Arachne uh, for, for dynamic security testing. Um, the other thing I would, I would throw out there is um, service virtualization. Uh, we all have constraints. We all have third parties we're constrained by. We have teams, internal teams that we're waiting for stuff. We have test data constraints. Service virtualization is critical. Um, I was not, I didn't know about it five years ago. I didn't understand how it, I thought it was like just talking about stubs. Okay, whatever. Um, you can't do continuous delivery without service virtualization. You need to be able to, you know, if I have a test, 
and I'm testing a backend system, but it's I'm, I'm testing that API. Well, why do I have to go to that backend system? Virtualize it, and with with the tools out today, I can have as dynamic and rich responses as I would if I was hitting the real backend system. Uh, you also might have limitations, like maybe you put you post a payment on something. Well, now that account's dead, and you can't use it. Well, maybe I'm using service virtualization in some of my other environments, you know, to get that early feedback, and then I go to the real one later on. So um, there's some there's some great uh, open source service virtualization tools. Um, you know, there's a, a Monty Bank by ThoughtWorks, which is a great tool, and Capital One actually contributes uh, to Monty Bank. There's Hoverfly, um, and then obviously like, there's the big vendors like Parasoft, uh, you know, which which is a great tool as well. Um, and then uh, you pro you know test data. Test data is a tricky one. Um, we built something homegrown for test data. Um, it seems to be a big opportunity in the industry. Service virtualization can help minimize some of that, but you might have to build something on your own for conditioning your data uh, because it is most, when you look at your automated tests, a lot of what you're doing is setting up a scenario. So how do you build something out to you know do that quickly so it doesn't have to be part of your test? Um, let's see. The other thing maybe is Docker mm. and containers. Uh, when, you know, when you talk about test environments, being able to have a test environment that's on the shelf that you can, you know, stand up quickly, has every, all your dependencies in that environment, you can run your tests. Uh, you know, we created a suite of Docker containers that we could then plug into pipelines to be able to run our, our different test environments. Uh, we use Docker with JMeter in order to spin up all of our load generators. Like, there's, there's things like that that you can do. Um, so, obviously, understanding Docker and probably, like, the CI tool stack like Jenkins or Circle CI or drones, like you're gonna need to know those as well. That's a lot. <laughs> I can't believe how fast time went by, Adam. There's so many things I wanted to touch on that I couldn't get to, like security testing, performance testing. I just want to second your point about test data. Uh, what makes a lot of times, in my experience, flaky tests, not only the weight elements that people use or the weight uh, resources that they use, but also test data usually is kind of wonky. But I really wanted to get into uh, some questions, but before we get into the questions, I know you're, you're making a changeover, and one of the last questions I always ask every guest on my podcast test talks is, before we go, is there one piece of actual advice you can give someone to improve their DevOps efforts? So before we jump into the questions, really quickly, is there one piece of actual advice you think anyone on this call can use now that's going to automatically, not automatically, but they, that they can implement right away to help them with their efforts? I think that the biggest thing is just have that mindset of like eliminate your constraints. Mm -hmm. So look around you, what is slowing you down and how do you, what's in your control to eliminate that constraint, whether it's, um, whether it's, you know, service virtualization or, or spending time on automation or whatever it is. But um, I think look at what your constraint, what slows you down and find ways to eliminate that and then move on to the next thing. Awesome. Great advice. Definitely agree. So I'm just going to jump into the comments now, into the questions. So we have a question from Solomon. I'm terrible with names, so I apologize. I'm not going to mention the last names because I'll, I'll botch them. So this is a question you'll get asked, I'm sure, often is, uh, would it be called DevOps if I'm using Jenkins, Git, and adding unit tests, performance tests, security tests, and PIP? I would say yes, but uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, that – so um... – Again, DevOps is a mindset. So what you're right. doing with those tools is you're building out continuous integration, which is great, um, so that every check-in has that pipeline to use Jenkins and then run those tests. I think you know DevOps and having that DevOps mindset is going to get you to hopefully get you to continuous delivery, and that's the goal. How do you use those tools to create that automated assembly line and eliminate the need to have someone to, to a dedicated resource? To have to move something to production or support it, that you have in essence this this automated uh, character that's able to certify and promote your code. That's your goal. That's what DevOps will allow you, and those are the right tools to be using. Awesome. So we have another question from Topeka V, and uh, this is, I guess this is more of a question towards environments that you must have dealt with. So should tests be automated in QA or Dev environments? Both. 
I think you mentioned it perfectly, right? Like in my dev environment, I'm going to run my unit tests. I'm going to run like some level of, of smoke tests. And then once I have a uh, confidence that things are working, I'm going to go to another environment. Maybe in this, in this test environment, everything is stubbed out and I'm running my smoke test and then I'm running my acceptance test and some level of performance. And then if that works, I go to an integrated environment where now I'm, I'm hitting more of my back ends. Maybe I'm not running all those same tests over again. Maybe I'm running a subset, but that's what you're going to end up doing. You're going to create like a series of tests that, that build upon each other with a specific purpose. And yes, you absolutely want to be running tests in development. Definitely. Not, by, not its own, but you're going to build. Yep, absolutely. Run them everywhere. So that comes back to test data management. I've seen teams that struggle with that, and that's why they only run it in one environment. So that, that might be something that is impeding them from doing that. So we, we have another question. Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, like, for service virtualization. Yep. Like, you can stub that stuff out to make sure that the same test is able to run in all those environments regardless of what constraints you have. Absolutely. So we have another question from Peter. And Peter asks, um, so making people capable of doing several jobs within several platforms is going to take a lot of hours. So how do you measure the improvement that this practice brings? How do you justify all this, uh, depending on mm -hmm. what people are doing and what the output is? Uh, that can be very tricky. Um, I will tell you the way, best way is to create a baseline around uh, your deployment frequency and your um, your deployment frequency, your production defects, and maybe like mean time to recover. And basically, you want to be able to show that over time we're able to to have more th things go into production with higher quality um, and react quicker. Um, you know, you you, don't, you want to kind of stay away from like we're more productive by using velocity or other things because that can be gamed. It's it's a little tougher, but for us, you know, being able to show release frequency and production quality and mean time to recover, like those were the core metrics to be able to show over time, like this is having value. Awesome, great. Uh, Nahid Patel asks, uh, we talked about virtualization a few times already, and if someone's doing end-to-end -end testing, how can they, he, he's, they're asking, how do we do virtualization for back-end parts while doing automated tests? So I think if this is a database that's feeding an application, how do you virtualize that? Everything can be virtualized. The front end can be virtualized. The back end can be virtualized. Now, um, what I would ask you is, like, um, you are going to want to run end-to-end -end tests. However, how many do you have today? How long do they take to run? Are they all your critical transactions? Um, and where service virtualization would help you is, I can take those end-to-end -end tests, I can virtualize my back end, and I can run that in development or integration. I can run a much, uh, not integration, but system. I can run them earlier to make sure that everything else is working, and then when I need to, I can run it, you know, all the way to the back end. Maybe I virtualize the, the, the calling in, so I can just isolate the back end versus the front, and I can run them quicker. Um, you really need to look at all of your end-to-end -end tests and question, do I need to have all of these? Can I simplify them? Because those tests, um, they're large, they take a lot to maintain, they're slow. So I'm not telling you not to do them. I'm just telling, like, service virtualization can help you break them up so that you have less of them, but you're still doing that testing only components earlier on. Awesome. What I like about being able to, to look through these questions is that I get to choose ones that are like my pet peeves. And so one of them that I think we we'll probably disagree on is I hate the concept of when someone says agile, that means putting everyone in one tiny room, and that means they're agile. You know, you're face-to-face, -face, you have no personal space. So, sorry, that's just a rant. That, uh, the reason why I say that is someone left a question saying, do you see resistance to community spaces? I could see the value, but presumably you come across technical people who consider this a distraction from their real work. And this is why I work remotely, because I definitely agree with this. So what are your thoughts on it? Um, I will tell you this. Um, it's all about the team norms. Um, you can have an Agile team that's all remote uh, and be as high, as productive as a team sitting in a room. Um, as long as your team norms make it a level playing field for everybody. When I, when I see remote people 
uh, be uh, not as productive. It's because um, the other people on the team are sitting together and they don't, they don't, uh, maybe the bridge line isn't set up right away. They don't have the tools in place. Like the way that team is operating, they treat that remote person like a third class citizen. And mm -hmm. so they can't get information quickly. They can't ask questions quickly, but a team that treats everybody the same, like even if some people are, are in the same location, others are remote, but all your calls, all your meetings are only calls are only on Skype or, or video. And you always have a, you know, a Slack channel or communication, like you've done things so that this is how we communicate. They will be just as successful. Um, offshore and onshore in one team. I'm not a fan of that. I think like everybody should be in the same time zone so that you can all communicate in real time, whether they're sitting together or they're virtual can be either as long as like I said those norms are the same for everybody um, so yeah I agree I mean communication once again communication is the key here so if you're able to have teams communicate if they're all remote then that's what you want I've seen teams that are all local and they don't communicate so really the, the, the goal is not to get everyone co-located the goal is to get everyone communicating and that's that's what I think the key yes. is absolutely right. So Adam, we're getting really close here. Uh, we'll take a few more questions. One of them is from Enrico. Uh, Enrico is asking, can you give us a, like one example of if someone is coming from a waterfall to, to a, an agile DevOps world, what would be the place that you would start? What's the lowest hanging fruit that you could achieve to actually implement something to show here's some value that we got out of DevOps? Uh, uh, to me, it's the automated testing. Okay. I think it's it's... Um, starting at starting with that, start there. Uh, focus on your test automation. How do you try to keep up with development, and how do you put them into a, a CI tool like Jenkins? Start there. Um, you can then feather in the, the build and deployment, and then you know pile on after that. But start you know the low hanging fruit really is the manual testing, the testing effort itself. Awesome. And Adam, I think actually that's all we have for today. Uh, it was really great speaking with you. Thank you so much for all your insights. There's a lot of other questions here. Uh, I'm sure Apply Tools will, will, will address them or they actually might make great blog posts for me. So thank you for these questions. And I'm sure Adam, uh, you know, we'll be speaking again later, but thank you so much for your time and thank you Apply Tools for setting this up. Uh, I think this is a growing area that everyone's going to need to learn if they're in testing. And uh, thank you, Adam, once again, for sharing all your insights in this. Thank you. Thank you, Apple Tools.